A firestorm of reaction after Judge Brett Kavanaugh is finally seated on the Supreme Court. Chief Justice John Roberts swearing in Kavanaugh as the newest associate justice after a close confirmation vote. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new hour inside America's news headquarters. I'm Arthel Neville. Hi, Arthel. Hi, Mike. And I'm Mike Emanuel. And for Eric Sean, a deeply divided Senate voting to confirm Kavanaugh to the high court, handing President Trump a major political victory. The bruising battle surrounding this nomination raising questions about whether Judge Kavanaugh's time on the bench will be seen as tarnished. Here's Kellyanne Conway earlier today. Justice Kavanaugh should not be seen as tainted. He should be seen as somebody who went through seven FBI investigations, including just in this last week, another one that was completed this past July, had answered 1,200 written questions, had produced about a million pages of documents, submitted himself to about 33 or 35 hours of sworn testimony to the Senate, including denying the allegations that were put before him. And they should look at his entire record the way Senator Susan Collins did. Kevin Quark's live on the North Lawn of the White House with the latest reaction. Hello, Kevin. Hey there, Mike. Good afternoon. Don't forget, Monday night, 7 p.m., right here at the White House, the president will welcome the newest associate justice of the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh, here to the White House for a swearing-in ceremony. And then, of course, it's Tuesday morning, off to work, his very first day on the high court. He was actually sworn in by his mentor, Justice Anthony Kennedy. Uh, for whom he clerked, you may remember, as well as, as you mentioned there, Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, that Kavanaugh's bid, Mike, finally made it over the political finish line was certainly the high point of an already strong week for the White House, which also saw President Trump hammer out a new trade deal with Mexico and Canada. And, and in front of 11,000 folks last night at that rally in Topeka, Kansas, uh, he talked about that. But frankly, all anyone wanted to hear about was Justice Kavanaugh. The political battle, by the way, as well, that will be fought in the midterms next month. I want to thank our incredible Republican senators for refusing to back down in the face of the Democrats' shameless campaign of political and personal destruction. Each of you will have a chance in just four weeks to render your verdict on the Democrats' conduct at the ballot box. Challenge made right there. Now, with Congress battered and fractured, some would say, in the wake of the confirmation, there actually are some Democrats who are hopeful that the body of lawmakers and, indeed, the nation can finally begin to heal. The challenge I'm focused on, Chuck, is looking forward at how it is we can heal the Senate after this bitter and divisive and very partisan week and how we work to restore or strengthen some of the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Chris Coons right there. Now, among the very first cases Justice Kavanaugh will have an opportunity to hear, Mike, is one involving uh, the detainment of an illegal immigrant and what can be done if they're also facing a deportation hearing. It's a very interesting case, one of many that will cross the uh, desks of all the justices. Again, big night coming up here tomorrow night, but for now, back to you. Promises to be a fast start on the high court. Kevin Cork yes, leading us off on the North Lawn. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Mm -hmm. All right, Kevin and Mike, well, now that Justice Brett Kavanaugh has been sworn into the court, Republicans and Democrats are hoping the heated confirmation hearings will help drive their supporters to the polls. Here is Senator Lindsey Graham this morning. I've never been more pissed in my life. I voted for Sotomayor and Kagan. I would have never done this to them. This was character assassination. This was wanting power too much. And to the extent that I came to the aid of this good man and helped defeat this debacle, I am happy as a clam. But will the passion displayed by both sides energize voters? Joining us from Washington with more on the political fallout from the confirmation hearings is Garrett Tinney. Hi, Garrett. Well, Arthel, we will likely see the fallout from these confirmation votes for years to come. And at this point, it appears the fight is far from over. Now that Justice Kavanaugh is seated on the high court, Democrats are trying to capitalize on the anti-Kavanaugh protest by promising to launch further investigations into the allegations against him and potentially even impeach him if they are able to retake the House. On Fox News Sunday, Senator Lindsey Graham said that strategy could actually backfire and end up helping Republicans in a lot of swing districts that the Democrats are targeting. So I hope everybody running for the House in these purple districts 
will ask will be asked the question do you support impeaching judge Kavanaugh based on five allegations none of which could be corroborated do you want an outcome so badly that you would uh, basically turn the law upside down now, holding on to the House will still be a challenge for the GOP, but in the Senate, the confirmation fighting votes could actually help them pick up another seat or two. Just take a look there at North Dakota. Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp was trailing Republican challenger Kevin Kramer by 12 points in a Fox News poll this week, and that was before she voted against Kavanaugh's confirmation. In that same poll, a third of likely voters said they were less likely to vote for Heitkamp if she voted against the nominee. With all of the passions and protests we saw this past week, though, Democrats believe they are in a strong position 30 days out from the midterms. We have an election coming up, and I've said to the women who are, who are justifiably angry but uh, determined, I, and I said they should be just focused like a laser beam on the elections because they have connected the dots. They know that the senators who are making these confirmation decisions are the people who are elected by their voters. So even now that Justice Brett Kavanaugh is seated on the high court, this fight over his confirmation will continue to play out in the midterms, 2020, and well beyond. Arthel. Garrett Tinney. Thank you, Garrett. Mike. You Arthel, with more on all this, let's bring in Haley Britsky, news desk reporter with Axios. Haley, great to have you. Thank you. 30 days from the midterms. There's a ton of emotion on both sides. I want to play a clip of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on Fox News Sunday, and we will discuss. And then the mob descended on Capitol Hill and tried to intimidate our members into opposing this good man's nomination. Uh, we stood up to the mob. We established that the, the presumption of innocence is still important. How has the Supreme Court battle affected conservatives, Haley? That's a really good question, and I, and I think what we're seeing right now is that the Republican base is just getting as angry as we thought the Democrats were going into 2018 election. I mean, uh, we, we've, we've seen that uh, every Republican leader, like Senator McConnell just said, that this has become the defining issue for Republicans. Um, across the spectrum, Republican voters are feeling attacked by this. They feel not heard. They feel that um, this is just a, a, a needless attack by Democrats. And so I think that we can expect to see a surge of Republicans um, just really taking this anger to the polls in the same way we expected to see Democrats do in November. Take a listen to Democrat Senator Maisie Hirono, member of the Judiciary Committee, on the emotion on the other side. The anger is real. There are a lot of people who feel very, very strongly. And uh, the Republicans seem to forget what happened during the passage of the Affordable Care Act, where, believe me, the Democrats were the focus and the brunt of screams, uh, uh, coughings being left on our doorsteps, all of that. So what about the political left at this stage? Right. So we know, obviously, we've seen the protests, um, the, the Democratic lawmakers, they are just as outraged about this. Um, this has really fueled anger on both sides of the spectrum who are just saying that they aren't being listened to, that they're being ignored and that uh, the other party is kind of controlling things or trying to control things. Um, especially we know coming into November, we've heard time and time again, this is the year of the woman. And so Democrats are going to be using this uh, a lot to empower Democratic women to get to the polls. Um, they're going to be really impassioned to get out and say something about this. And so I'm sure that that anger is not going away anytime soon. There was a lot of polling suggesting Democrats having a significant edge and enthusiasm gap. Has that changed with this Kavanaugh battle? We have seen polls sort of say that there were more Republicans than originally, uh, you know, polled, saying that they were more excited to get to the polls, that they were more um, interested in their in voting. And so I think it'll be very interesting to see how exactly that plays out in November. Um, again, we know that both sides are taking this very personally. Um, this issue is going to become central to the November elections. We can expect all the candidates to be pointing this out, people that are campaigning for them pointing this out. Um, so this certainly is not going away anytime soon. And, and Republicans are really going to be taking this to their voters across the country. What about the impact on red state, Trump state Democrats who voted no? Donnelly of Indiana, Heitkamp of North Dakota, McCaskill of Missouri? Right. So that's going to be, um, you know, we, we, we know that uh, especially Heidi Heitkamp, we've seen her polls sort of start to switch, right? And so people that um, originally were, were very in favor of her are starting to back away from that. Um, Joe Manchin is getting a lot of heat for, for what he's doing from his own party. Um, but he, he knows who his base is. He knows sure. that West Virginia um, voters are going to be interested in seeing Kavanaugh on the court. And so um, a lot of senators just were sort of having to make these political decisions. And uh, w whether or not they believe they're political decisions, um, I, th I think their voters may see the Another way. And certainly we'll let the voters decide who wins and who loses, but I've had some folks on Capitol Hill suggest that 
Joe Manchin of West Virginia may have virtually guaranteed his reelection by voting for Kavanaugh in a big President Trump state. Right. I mean, I, I certainly have heard the same thing. It'll be very interesting to see how his voters react to that. I, I'm sure that they're happy with the way that he voted. Um, he knew they would be. That's why he did that. And so uh, we, we know that coming from a red state and being a Democrat, you sort of have to read your constituents and see what would they like him to do. And while that certainly was not um, popular with his colleagues in the Democratic Party, he knows what his voters wanted and he went with that. And so wh whether or not that that, um, you know, hurts sort of funding on the Democratic side, running against him in West Virginia. Um, it'll be interesting to see all the different uh, kind of parts that play out in this. All right. Haley Britsky from Oxios, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Arthel? Well, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo touting another step forward in talks with Kim Jong-un as he wraps up his fourth trip to North Korea. Those details ahead. Plus, are we seeing a midterm momentum shift? The factors that could increase Republican turnout in November. Under Republican leadership, America is booming. America is thriving. America is winning. It was announced that unemployment has fallen to 3.7 percent, the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. The midterms are 30 days away and Republicans are trying to keep their momentum going after a series of big political wins this week. First, unemployment dropped to a 49-year low. Then Justice Kavanaugh was confirmed and sworn into the Supreme Court. Now all eyes are turning toward November 6th. Jennifer Griffin has more. In the wake of the narrow Senate vote that allowed President Trump to deliver on one of his key campaign promises to fill vacancies on the Supreme Court with a second conservative justice, changing the balance of the court for a generation, the swearing in of Justice Brett Kavanaugh by Chief Justice John Roberts last night may give Republicans a boost in lagging energy heading into the midterm elections next month, according to Republican strategists. The Democrats have doubled down on resist and obstruct the past two years, but this this has brought all of that to the forefront. I think Republicans have woken up and said, listen, it's a very clear choice. Do we want resi resist, obstruct, delay? Jobs figures this week are also likely to contribute to Republican momentum heading into the midterms, with unemployment figures at 3.7 percent, a 45-year historic low. Donations from small donors to the RNC are also up since August. The number of donations from low-dollar donors is up 175 percent. The amount of money money raised is up 194 percent, and the average gift is up 111 percent. The amount of money raised from text donations is nearly double what it was before the fight for the Supreme Court seat heated up. New polling also shows a GOP enthusiasm bounce. Compared to early September, the number of Republicans feeling extremely interested in the election climbed two points in Arizona, within the margin of error, and nine points in Indiana, eight points in Missouri, and 11 points in Tennessee, according to Wednesday's Fox News poll. Democrats, for their part, are also fueling anger over the Kavanaugh vote into focus on the midterms. Protesters at the Capitol and on the steps of the Supreme Court chanted about voting in November. A political action committee set up in Maine to counter Senator Susan Collins, who cast the deciding vote for Kavanaugh, has already raised $3 million. In Washington, Jennifer Griffin, Fox News. Thank you, Jennifer. I think the Republicans are going to do great in the midterms. I think we have a momentum that hasn't been seen in years. When you hear those screamers in Congress today, the screaming, and you see how orchestrated it is, how phony it is. It's, it's, they practice it together, and they do it with the Democrats. President Trump on his way to last night's rally in Kansas, suggesting Republicans are surging into the midterms while Democrats are merely orchestrating rage. This after the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation battle fueled heated emotions on both sides of the political divide. A new Marist PBS NewsHour poll shows Republican voter th enthusiasm has jumped 12 points since July into a virtual dead heat with Democrats. Joining me now is Terry Madonna, director of the Franklin and Marshall College Poll and founder of the Keystone Poll. Terry, thanks for being here. So, My pleasure. Absolutely. So if the Kavanaugh hearings and confirmation is going to, to be a spark to fire up voters and get them to the polls, how will each party use the fuel yeah. to their political advantage? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it does have the propensity to increase turnout 
in both parties. Remember, the average midterm turnout is about 40 percent of eligible voters. I think we could have record turnout in the midterm election on November 6th. Let's take a look at the Democrats first. There isn't any doubt that midterm elections are a referendum on the president. And that's historically been the case, and that's not going to change. But the Democrats are, are going to campaign on a different set of arguments. They're going to talk about sexual abuse, about female discrimination. That's going to weigh in big time as the Democrats campaign, particularly in certain states and in certain congressional and certain congressional districts. And remember, almost 50 percent of the of the candidates running for Congress on the Democratic ticket are women. That's a record number. So that's going to play in to, to the group, uh, the demographic that the Democrats uh, weigh in with, uh, work hard to get out on November 6th. The other group are millennials, the 18 to 34-year-olds. They've been registering in some states in record numbers. So for the Democrats, I think it's females and it's millennials. If they're going to succeed in the midterm, I think those are the two groups that they're going to place heavy emphasis on. For Republicans, I think the Republican Party will go back to its base. President Trump is coming uh, this week to Erie, Pennsylvania. We're talking about working class voters in places where mining, the old mining and mill towns where iron and steel and coal once predominated in states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin. The four Rust Belt states that, in effect, gave President Trump, you know, up to the three, not totally, but close to the 304 electoral votes over the 270 that's necessary. So the campaign is basically changing, I think. It's going to be less probably about President Trump per se. He'll still be a major factor. It's going to be about the groups that I've mentioned. And well, let me add one other, one other big point. This election more than any in recent memory. If you're a Democrat, we want our party to take control of Congress. If you're a Republican, we want to make sure that our party retains the hold on Congress. Right. And that, that's dominating virtually everything. Terry, I want to um, refer to an article in The Hill. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, is quoted saying, quote, our base is on fire. And he's saying this while predicting that expected votes against Kavanaugh by Democratic uh, Senators Joe Donnelly of Indiana, oh, Heidi right. Heitkamp, New North Dakota, uh, Claire McCaskill, Montana, and uh, I mean, Missouri, and then uh, um, John Tester of Montana will be, Tester, right. will come back to bite them next month. This is what the senator is saying. Yeah. When they are up for re election in states that you know, won um, by President won Trump, by Trump in 2016. Yeah. So, Senator McConnell also went yeah. on to say that uh, only one of the red state Democrats voted in the way that helped him politically, and that was Joe Manchin, referring to the Joe West Manchin. Virginia senator. So, Terry, while political tribalism is at a fever pitch and an all time <laughs> high, do you have predictions about how the extreme polarization will impact our democracy? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about it. I mean, there have all these estimates about how polarized we've been in the past. You go back to the differences in the Vietnam War. Some have even said you have to go back to the American Civil War to find us that divided. I'm not going to go there. But I'll tell you, the, the Pew uh, Research people put out a poll a couple of months ago. And how about this? Almost 8 in 10 Americans think that Democrats and Republicans just don't disagree on the plans that each party has. It's their policies. But how about this? On the facts. So think about that as a true indicator of how divided we are when it's not just, well, what's your party want yeah, to do about so healthcare? Yeah, but so I'm asking what's you, what's party? the future of our democracy based on the extreme it's, partisan it, yeah. atmosphere right now? It's scary. It's scary. Uh, I mean, I think we're in uncharted territory in modern history. And if we don't learn somehow, some way how to compromise. And here's something else. Remember, the Democrats have become virtually the party of urban America with an urban constituency. The Republicans have become the party of small town and rural America. And it's sort of never, never, never the middle shall meet. And, they, and the two parties fight over the suburbs. And they have d differences based on whether the suburbs are in the south, for example, or up in the northeast. So but I don't have, I don't, I don't think there's a recipe to get us out of the situation we are unless more and more 
politicians wake up and understand how dangerous the climate we have is to the fundamentals of our democracy. Well, You're absolutely me, right about the question. Yeah, well, then let me ask you this. We showed the president on Air Force One while he was heading to uh, the campaign rally in T Topeka, Kansas, you know, saying, listen, the Republicans have momentum while the Democrats are, quote, orchestrating rage. So in, in, in 30 or so seconds, should the president of the United States work more to rile his base or should yeah. he work to bring the country together? Well, you would, think, you would think it would be the latter, but remember what this is about, 23 seats in the House of Representatives, and if the Democrats were to gain control of Congress, of, of the House in particular, look, you can, we can use the I word, impeach a certain associate justice of the Supreme Court and perhaps move to impeach the president. But I do agree, the leadership has to come from the president of the United States to reach out to more people than just his base. I understand why that might go on until November 6th, but there has to be a radical and an abrupt change in the, in the months ahead. So we'll see what happens post midterm. Terry, Madonna, thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday afternoon. Thank you. A journalist mysteriously disappears on assignment in Turkey. Why investigators now say they are fearing the worst. Plus, what does the confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh to the high court mean for future legal battles on controversial issues? We take that up with a constitutional attorney next. With Brett Kavanaugh seated on the Supreme Court, conservatives now have a solid five to four majority, especially when it comes to contentious issues like abortion, gun rights, and presidential powers. Justice Elena Kagan, who hired Brett Kavanaugh when she was dean of Harvard Law School, says it's important for the court to maintain its reputation of being fair and impartial. We all get along genuinely very well. I think we, we, uh, we, we all believe that everybody is operating in good faith around the table, even if we disagree strongly with them. Chrisanne Hall is a constitutional attorney and educator. She joins us now. Hi, Chrisanne. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. What's striking to me is while Judge Kavanaugh is a conservative, he and President Obama's last Supreme Court pick, Merrick Garland, voted together 93% of the time. So what are your expectations for now Justice Kavanaugh? You know, I don't see uh, Justice Kavanaugh changing the makeup of this court in any in any way as you said he he votes lockstep with Merrick Garland and I believe that he is simply uh, Justice Kennedy 2.0 and so what we're gonna see is not a changing of the court as Gorsuch probably will be a more constitutional justice but a court that is has been stabilized by maintaining a sort of judicial status quo by simply replacing Kennedy with someone who's exactly like him. Uh, Kavanaugh is, is not a strictly constitutional the way Gorsuch has uh, proven himself to be. Kavanaugh was in favor of Obamacare. He has uh, a history of favoring the expansion of federal power over Fourth Amendment restrictions. And not only that, uh, his his reliance on precedent shows us that he probably will not be the justice that will overturn Roe v. Wade or any other Supreme Court opinion that Kavanaugh feels is settled law. Outside liberal groups made it sound like they really had to stop the Kavanaugh nomination. <laughs> uh, was that necessary? No, I don't think so. I think this was all just political fervor. And I think the fact, I mean, look at what Susan Collins said, proving that what we see here is a, a justice that was liberal enough for Susan Collins. And that, her statements of fact based on his historical judgments, I think prove to us that this was just a, a liberal left hysteria designed not to uh, legitimately oppose a candidate, but to stir up their base for political and election purposes. And I think it's very sad to me to see people who are not aware of the facts, not aware of the way Kavanaugh actually voted and held in his opinions, uh, opposing somebody that I think they're going to, in the end, actually approve of his opinions. Do you expect tension between Kavanaugh and some of the court's more liberal members? 
Oh, absolutely not. Um, this is this is not political theater. Once you actually get into the Supreme Court, you see a history of justices that that work together. They actually are uh, professional. They they listen to judgments. We're not we're not talking about Kavanaugh sitting on the Supreme Court bench, being uh, accused of criminal activity, something that he feels unjustly. So so you're not going to see that kind of response. And if we look historically, I mean, think about the fact that uh, Scalia and uh, Ginsburg, who have polarized ideologies in opposite directions, they were even reputed to be very, very good friends, spending lots of personal time together. So this is not what people are expecting uh, from you know, all of the political hype that we're seeing. Kavanaugh is not going to upturn and become this outrageous, uh, angry man on the bench. That's, that, that's just not how the Supreme Court works. All right, we'll see how it plays out. He's taking the bench this week. Chris Ann Hall, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hollywood star is rallying around Justice Kavanaugh's accuser, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Many celebrities going on social media showing their disapproval for Kavanaugh's confirmation. Stars pushing for a blue wave this November and calling on Americans to vote. Jeff Paul is in our Los Angeles bureau with all those details. Hi, Jeff. All right, Val, some celebrities going as far as calling Kavanaugh's confirmation a gross and terrible day in American history. Ellen DeGeneres writing, this tweet is for Dr. Ford. You put yourself through so much, and I want you to know it wasn't in vain. You started a movement, and we'll see it through. If they won't listen to our voices, then they'll listen to our vote. Actor Jim Carrey tweeting a drawing of Dr. Ford writing, real American heroism. Dr. Ford risked everything to tell the truth about this privileged Kavanaugh goon, a venture in November. NBC Saturday Night Live also poking fun at Republican senators in its cold open for the show last night. Woo! We're going to Kavanaugh this tonight! Everyone's pumped from white men over 60 to white men over 70. We made a lot of women real worried today, but I'm not getting pregnant, so I don't care. It's the last thing I wanted was to make this about me. That's why I told everyone to tune in at 3 p.m. so I could tell all my female supporters, psych! Not everyone in Hollywood was upset over Kavanaugh's confirmation. Outspoken conservative actor James Woods sending a short but concise tweet writing, hashtag, or writing justice, Kavanaugh, hashtag winning. Actress Christy Swanson, known for her movie role as the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer, also tweeting, don't forget to crack open a beer and toast Supreme Court Judge Kavanaugh today because of those of us that still believe in due process, won. Other celebrities like Reese Witherspoon not mentioning Kavanaugh or Ford simply tweeting how she cannot wait to vote in November. Arthel? Jeff Paul there in Los Angeles. Thank you, Jeff. Mike? Arthel, first it was Seattle, and now all of King County, Washington is doing it, decriminalizing small amounts of drugs, not just marijuana, but all drugs. Dan Springer has the story from Seattle. Seattle police stop known drug users, not to bust them, but to keep them out of jail. It's called the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. It began in Seattle and is spreading across the country. Ron Hobby was homeless, frequently behind bars, and strung out before becoming a lead client. He's still doing drugs, but he got a government-subsidized apartment and says he stopped committing crimes. They're letting me know that, you know, okay, you can fall down, but you don't have to stay down, you know, and we're here to help you back up. 20 cities now operate LEAD programs, and according to its National Support Bureau, 31 more are looking into the harm reduction. We know if you're being helped that you're going to do less harm not only to yourself, but less harm to the neighborhood that you live in. But critics point out Seattle's homeless population has more than quadrupled in five years, with 400 illegal encampments littered with used needles. Open drug use is rampant. You look at the streets, you look at how things have just exploded around here, and nobody in their right mind would say that we are on the right track now. And lead has not led to cost savings. The budgets for the county jail, prosecutor, and public defender's office are all still going up. Critics say police officers are frustrated. If you don't like the law, get rid of it, but don't tell us to ignore it. Stop doing that. You know, we're here to enforce the laws. Advocates say it's about saving lives, even those coming to Seattle for the lax enforcement. 
So would the solution just to be to let people die in misery in another place? City officials insist the homelessness crisis is driven much more by the high cost of housing here than by people moving in for social services. But either way, the drug problem has never been more visible, even as spending hits record highs every year. In Seattle, Dan Springer, Fox News. Thanks, Dan. Well, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is in the middle of his Asia trip and reporting more progress with North Korea after meeting with Kim Jong-un today. President Trump sharing these images on his Twitter account. Today's meeting covering denuclearization and a potential second summit. Trey Yanks is following the story from our Jerusalem Bureau. Hi, Trey. Well, good afternoon, Arthel. We are learning today that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and North Korea's Kim Jong-un have agreed to arrange a second meeting between President Trump and the North Korean leader as soon as possible. That information according to the office of South Korea's President Moon Jae-in. Now, on Sunday, Secretary Pompeo visited Pyongyang, North Korea, for the fourth time to meet with Kim Jong-un. Pompeo had a two-hour meeting and a 90-minute lunch with the Korean dictator to discuss the next steps in a larger plan for denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. This meeting follows a summit in June of this year between Kim Jong-un and President Trump, where it was agreed upon that North Korea would work towards giving up its nuclear weapons and improving relations with the United States. Now, since that gathering in Singapore, the U.S. negotiations with North Korea have stalled, causing President Trump to previously cancel a planned trip for Secretary Pompeo to Pyongyang back in August. Now, following Pompeo's meeting today in North Korea, the Secretary of State traveled to Seoul, South Korea, where he met with President Moon Jae-in. Along Side the leader of South Korea, Pompeo said that he and Kim Jong-un had a good productive conversation and called the talks another step forward. Now, it's important to look at this in the context of Pompeo's next stop, where he will travel to Beijing, China, and meet with his counterpart there. All of this, though, uh, knowing the fact that the Chinese do play a crucial role in North Korea's foreign policy and are currently engaged in a deep trade battle with the United States. Arthel? Trey Yinks, thank you very much. Mike? Arthel, a magnitude 5.9 earthquake striking Haiti this weekend, killing at least 12 people, dozens of others injured. Officials say the quake's epicenter was at the northern tip of the island. Haiti, of course, is still struggling to recover from a devastating 7.1 magnitude earthquake back in 2010 that killed some 300,000 people and reduced much of the capital, Port-au-Prince, to rubble. Haiti needs a break. Well, some stark words from Turkish authorities about a Washington Post reporter who went missing in Istanbul. What they're saying and how this could raise tensions between two key U.S. allies in the Middle East. Plus, the U.S. and other Western powers fighting back against Russia's cyber attacks that targeted top Olympic athletes and anti-doping organizations. How the U.S. is preparing to fend off any potential attacks in next month's midterms. With Brett Kavanaugh seated on the Supreme Court, conservatives now have a solid five to four majority, especially when it comes to contentious issues like abortion, gun rights, and presidential powers. Justice Elena Kagan, who hired Brett Kavanaugh when she was dean of Harvard Law School, says it's important for the court to maintain its reputation of being fair and impartial. We all got along genuinely very well. I think we. We, uh, we, we all believe that everybody is operating in good faith around the table, even if we disagree strongly with them. Chrisanne Hall is a constitutional attorney and educator. She joins us now. Hi, Chrisanne. Hi. Thank you for having me on the show. What's striking to me is while Judge Kavanaugh is a conservative, he and President Obama's last Supreme Court pick, Merrick Garland, voted together 93 percent of the time. So what are your expectations for now Justice Kavanaugh? You know, I don't see uh, Justice Kavanaugh changing the makeup of this court in any in any way. As you said, he, he votes lockstep with Merrick Garland, and I believe that he is simply uh, Justice Kennedy 2.0. And so what we're going to see is not a changing of the court, as Gorsuch probably will be a more constitutional justice, but a court that is has been stabilized by maintaining a sort of judicial status quo by simply replacing Kennedy with someone who's exactly like him. Uh, Kavanaugh is, is not a strictly constitutional the way Gorsuch has uh, proven himself to be. Kavanaugh was in favor of Obamacare. He has uh, a history of favoring the expansion of federal power over Fourth Amendment restrictions. And not only that, uh, his 
his reliance on precedent shows us that he probably will not be the justice that will overturn Roe v. Wade or any other Supreme Court opinion that Kavanaugh feels is settled law. Outside liberal groups made it sound like they really had to stop the Kavanaugh nomination. <laughs> uh, was that necessary? No, I don't think so. I think this was all just political fervor. And I think the fact, I mean, look at what Susan Collins said, proving that what we see here is a, a justice that was liberal enough for Susan Collins. And that her statements of fact, based on his historical judgments, I think prove to us that this was just a, a liberal left hysteria designed not to uh, legitimately oppose a candidate, but to stir up their base for political and election purposes. And I think it's very sad to me to see people who are not aware of the facts, not aware of the way Kavanaugh actually voted and held in his opinions, uh, opposing somebody that I think they're going to, in the end, actually approve of his opinions. Do you expect tension between Kavanaugh and some of the court's more liberal members? Oh, absolutely not. Um, this is this is not political theater. Once you actually get into the Supreme Court, you see a history of justices that that work together. They actually are uh, professional. They they listen to judgments. We're not we're not talking about Kavanaugh sitting on the Supreme Court bench, being uh, accused of criminal activity, something that he feels unjustly. So so you're not going to see that kind of response. And if we look historically, I mean, think about the fact that uh, Scalia and uh, Ginsburg, who have polarized ideologies in opposite directions, they were even reputed to be very, very good friends, spending lots of personal time together. So this is not what people are expecting uh, from you know, all of the political hype that we're seeing. Kavanaugh is not going to upturn and become this outrageous, uh, angry man on the bench. That's, that, that's just not how the Supreme Court works. All right, we'll see how it plays out. He's taking the bench this week. Chris Ann Hall, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hollywood star is rallying around Justice Kavanaugh's accuser, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. Many celebrities going on social media showing their disapproval for Kavanaugh's confirmation. Stars pushing for a blue wave this November and calling on Americans to vote. Jeff Paul is in our Los Angeles bureau with all those details. Hi, Jeff. All right, fellas, some celebrities going as far as calling Kavanaugh's confirmation a gross and terrible day in American history. Ellen DeGeneres writing, this tweet is for Dr. Ford. You put yourself through so much, and I want you to know it wasn't in vain. You started a movement, and we'll see it through. If they won't listen to our voices, then they'll listen to our vote. Actor Jim Carrey tweeting a drawing of Dr. Ford writing, real American heroism. Dr. Ford risked everything to tell the truth about this privileged Kavanaugh goon, a venture in November. NBC Saturday Night Live also poking fun at Republican senators in its cold open for the show last night. Woo! We're going to Kavanaugh this tonight! Everyone's pumped from white men over 60 to white men over 70. We made a lot of women real worried today, but I'm not getting pregnant, so I don't care. It's the last thing I wanted was to make this about me. That's why I told everyone to tune in at 3 p.m. so I could tell all my female supporters, psych! Not everyone in Hollywood was upset over Kavanaugh's confirmation. Outspoken conservative actor James Woods sending a short but concise tweet writing, hashtag, or writing justice, Kavanaugh, hashtag winning. Actress Christy Swanson, known for her movie role as the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer, also tweeting, don't forget to crack open a beer and toast Supreme Court Judge Kavanaugh today because of those of us that still believe in due process, one. Other celebrities like Reese Witherspoon not mentioning Kavanaugh or Ford simply tweeting how she cannot wait to vote in November. Arthel? Jeff Paul there in Los Angeles. Thank you, Jeff. Mike? Arthel, first it was Seattle, and now all of King County, Washington is doing it, decriminalizing small amounts of drugs, not just marijuana, but all drugs. Dan Springer has the story from Seattle. Seattle police stopped known drug users, not to bust them, but to keep them out of jail. 
It's called the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. It began in Seattle and is spreading across the country. Ron Hobby was homeless, frequently behind bars, and strung out before becoming a lead client. He's still doing drugs, but he got a government subsidized apartment and says he stopped committing crimes. They're letting me know that, you know, okay, you can fall down, but you don't have to stay down, you know, and we're here to help you back up. 20 cities now operate lead programs, and according to its National Support Bureau, 31 more looking into the harm reduction. We know if you're being helped that you're going to do less harm not only to yourself, but less harm to the neighborhood that you live in. But critics point out Seattle's homeless population has more than quadrupled in five years, with 400 illegal encampments littered with used needles. Open drug use is rampant. You look at the streets, you look at how things have just exploded around here, and nobody in their right mind would say that we are on the right track now. And lead has not led to cost savings. The budgets for the county jail, prosecutor, and public defender's office are all still going up. Critics say police officers are frustrated. If you don't like the law, get rid of it, but don't tell us to ignore it. Stop doing that. You know, we're here to enforce the laws. Advocates say it's about saving lives, even those coming to Seattle for the lax enforcement. So would the solution just to be to let people die in misery in another place? City officials insist the homelessness crisis is driven much more by the high cost of housing here than by people moving in for social services. But either way, the drug problem has never been more visible, even as spending hits record highs every year. In Seattle, Dan Springer, Fox News. Thanks, Dan. Well, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is in the middle of his Asia trip and reporting more progress with North Korea after meeting with Kim Jong-un today. President Trump sharing these images on his Twitter account. Today's meeting covering denuclearization and a potential second summit. Trey Yanks is following the story from our Jerusalem Bureau. Hi, Trey. Well, good afternoon, Arthel. We are learning today that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and North Korea's Kim Jong-un have agreed to arrange a second meeting between President Trump and the North Korean leader as soon as possible. That information according to the office of South Korea's President Moon Jae-in. Now, on Sunday, Secretary Pompeo visited Pyongyang, North Korea, for the fourth time to meet with Kim Jong-un. Pompeo had a two-hour meeting and a 90-minute lunch with the Korean dictator to discuss the next steps in a larger plan for denuclearization on the Korean peninsula. Peninsula. This meeting follows a summit in June of this year between Kim Jong-un and President Trump, where it was agreed upon that North Korea would work towards giving up its nuclear weapons and improving relations with the United States. Now, since that gathering in Singapore, the U.S. negotiations with North Korea have stalled, causing President Trump to previously cancel a planned trip for Secretary Pompeo to Pyongyang back in August. Now, following Pompeo's meeting today in North Korea, the Secretary of State traveled to Seoul, South Korea, where he met with President Moon Jae-in. Along Side the leader of South Korea, Pompeo said that he and Kim Jong-un had a good productive conversation and called the talks another step forward. Now, it's important to look at this in the context of Pompeo's next stop, where he will travel to Beijing, China, and meet with his counterpart there. All of this, though, uh, knowing the fact that the Chinese do play a crucial role in North Korea's foreign policy and are currently engaged in a deep trade battle with the United States. Arthel? Trey Yinks, thank you very much. Mike? Arthel, a magnitude 5.9 earthquake striking Haiti this weekend, killing at least 12 people, dozens of others injured. Officials say the quake's epicenter was at the northern tip of the island. Haiti, of course, is still struggling to recover from a devastating 7.1 magnitude earthquake back in 2010 that killed some 300,000 people and reduced much of the capital, Port-au-Prince, to rubble. Haiti needs a break. Well, some stark words from Turkish authorities about a Washington Post reporter who went missing in Istanbul. What they're saying and how this could raise tensions between two key U.S. allies in the Middle East. Plus, the U.S. and other Western powers fighting back against Russia's cyber attacks that targeted top Olympic athletes and anti-doping organizations. How the U.S. is preparing to fend off any potential attacks in next month's midterms.